questions or um, worrying about, you know, is this something you even want to know about? There are a lot of different ideas that comes about with genetics. You also hear about genetics in an awful lot of different terms. Um, it may be genetic therapy. It may be genetic specific to a tumor. A lot of people, there are so, several different levels of genetics that, that kind of confuse the issue. The flip side is that everybody has a pretty intuitive notion about genetics. I mean, when your daughter looks like you with the same color hair and eyes or personality or whatever, you automatically understand that it's from genetics. One of the things that was always uh, interesting to me was that when, when the gene that we're going to talk about today was first discovered, there was a big debate. They were, people were afraid to even mention this to patients because they thought, well, this is going to be very dramatic, very troubling news that this could be a genetic disorder. The, our genetics, uh, I was at University of Miami at the time, and the genetics professor came in. He said, oh, no, no, you can't mention this to patients. And I said, listen, I've been taking care of patients for a decade. These patients are in these families. They see the breast cancer in their families. When you reveal the possibility that this might be genetic to them, they don't even blink because they already have that very obvious intuitive understanding that this is something in their family when they see a lot of this disease. So today we're going to really talk about how empowering this information can be. Whether it directly affects you or not, I promise you it directly affects someone you know. And because of that, because I walk through my synagogue and I see dozens and dozens of women I know whose families or they themselves are affected by this gene, I also know that there are hundreds more that are missing this opportunity. And so today's message is not going to only be for you in terms of understanding it, but if it doesn't directly affect you, to think about people that it might directly affect because they're, they're, we're on a mission. I'm a bit of a mission here, and uh, we're going to talk about that. So first of all, let me back up. I promise you one thing, I'm not going to show you any of those gray globby pictures that <laughs> show up in textbooks or newspapers from, from time to time that look like little gray lines and I sit in amazement and wonder how they actually pair those off and figure out which is which. But I am going to try to put this into an understanding because the terminology can be very confusing. You hear chromosomes, you hear genes, you hear mutation, you don't know which is which. So we remember that every single human being in this room, even this guy back here on the camera, uh, started off with 23 pairs of chromosomes. That was your cell. You got one of each copy from your mother, you got one of each copy from your father, and we became a human being as a result. And every cell in our body has those same 23 pairs of chromosomes. The chromosomes are simply the name that organizes each of those little globs. And so I think of it as an encyclopedia set, and each volume is paired. Each volume has two copies, but there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. And every one of those chapters would be considered a gene that's telling some kind of information. So the thing to understand, and it is really this dramatic, is that even a single missing letter in a chapter could make the entire chapter unintelligible. And the reason for that has mostly to do with the fact that, that the way the gene is read requires that it be read exactly in sequence, and each section is taken off in sections of three. And if you add one or you take one away, you shift everything over after it, it's completely unintelligible. The good news is, since we have a lot of copies of genes, I mean, because